Welcome to On the Table, a podcast about board games, card games, and tabletop war games. Hey, it's Chase from On the Table Gaming, and today we're going to be speaking with Lee Bachma, the creator of a really cool self-published card game called Hordes of Power. Now, for all you A Song of Ice and Fire the Miniatures game listeners, later in the episode, we'll also hear from Brett Lanfer on some tips for getting the most out of Jon Snow from the Free Folk Heroes Box 3. I hope by now you figured out that I'm a, I'm a big fan of good people doing good work. And if you've ever thought about making your own game or have a soft spot for like retro sci-fi and fantasy settings that really hit on that 80s nostalgia, then you're going to want to hear about Hordes of Power. Uh, so without further ado, Lee, thanks so much for coming in to talk with us. Hi, thanks, Chase. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be on the show and talk a little bit about Hordes of Power. <laughs> First off, you know, right off the bat, Folks, you have to go check out uh, Hordes of Power, the website, the official website. You have a bunch of videos on there that capture so much of the energy and love of this game. But for those, as we're listening here, can you give us a, what's the quick elevator pitch for what is Hordes of Power? Okay, so Hordes of Power. It's a two to four player card game where you are a warlord on the Isle of Primal trying to take over the island by gathering a band of heroes and villains, sorcerers, robots, ninjas, monsters, all sorts of things to beat your opponent to uh, take over the island first. But unfortunately, uh, your opponent could kidnap, murder, brainwash, and curse you. So there's a back and forth as you're trying to raise your horde of power faster than your opponent can tear it down. This game is also fantastically flavorful. Like, the art for this is absolutely amazing. And you have actually created all the art for this game. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, that's that's correct. I'm, I'm actually an artist first and a game designer second. So uh, I've always had a passion for art and drawing. And I used to be a uh, an army helicopter pilot for 20 years. And drawing was just sort of a hobby after hours. And when I retired, I started drawing more and it started catching people's attention. And I just started getting some wild hairs and wild places. So I'm like, let's make a game and illustrate it as well. And that's kind of the birth of Hordes of Power. There's a lot of nods to like 80s nostalgia in here. I think there's like a little bit of, I think I caught some whiffs of like Thunder the Barbarian. And sometimes you can't quite put your finger on it, but you, you hit the tropes, you hit the style, you hit the art. What about, you know, that? era or that style of art like really drew you to making a game in this setting? So um, the art that I kind of did when I got serious about art and in this game, I was at a place in my life where I was really drawing on a lot of inspiration from my childhood. I was looking back on a very nostalgic time that brought me a lot of joy and a lot of happiness. And that happened to be kind of the early mid 80s. So yeah, you, you pick up the Thunder of the Barbarian, which was kind of a precursor to He-Man. There's a lot of nods to He-Man and Masters of the Universe in there. Uh, I was also a huge sci-fi fan, so you see nods to Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon. And and then, of course, I just couldn't stay in that era, so there's um, nods to current pop culture. You'll notice there's memes in there that are <laughs> like uh, re relevant. Like one of the goddesses in the game is you know, Karen, the goddess of entitlement, which is obviously <laughs> kind of a, a current meme. So it's a hodgepodge of things that I thought was interesting, fascinating, nostalgic, or brought me joy, and I just kind of slapped it all together into 110 cards and made a game out of it. The 80s are filled with so many gems uh, uh, and uh, so many yeah. cool properties. Um, you know, what, uh, were there any particular properties that really inspired you as a kid or continue to inspire you now in your, your overall art direction, maybe not even limited to just this game? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, growing up uh, as a child of the early 80s, uh, some of the things I first latched onto, I was growing up in a small town in Montana and a, a little tiny like book nook bookstore would occasionally get comics in. And I would go down there and I'd pick up Conan the Barbarian. I would pick up Mike Grell's Warlord oh, uh, as a DC I comic. about that. Yeah. And just flipping through those pages was like dumping rocket fuel <laughs> into my like eight-year-old brain. Um, just loved the magic, yeah. loved uh, the, the vibe. Uh, and then I started um, getting into similar properties like, you know, early 80s Thunder, their Barbarian came out and I, I was blown away by that. Um, and then two, I mean, two years after that, He-Man came out. And again, what a strange, strange thing He-Man was where, you know, they're just slapping elements of this is a barbarian in a loincloth wielding a battle axe. But his buddy over here is a robot with a laser gun. And you're like, what is happening, right? It's, yeah. It was pure magic as a kid to enjoy Masters of the Universe. So those are some of the seminal stuff that kind of inspired 
my love for this genre and the art style that uh, I use for the and game. And I love how in the game, like you can kind of tongue in cheek, go back and, and reference some of these tropes or character things, these weird mashups and, you know, uh, totally, you know, the, the stories you're telling with the cards are not too far off, maybe from some things you might've seen in some comics or uh, some of the TV shows like mind control or people switching sides or things like that. Um, right. Just, just yeah. The, the brainwash card looks. Uh, the brainwash card looks. Uh, I mean, if you look hard enough, it's not that different than like the slime pit from Masters of the Universe. Yeah. You know? So obviously heavily inspired there. And then another one of the my favorite tropes that I played with in the game is there's this character called Puffles, the cute but worthless psychic. <laughs> And uh, if you've watched 80s cartoons, you know that every single one of them had a comic relief worthless sidekick, you know, from Orko to Uni, the Snarf, you know, the list went on and on. And this guy is all of them smashed into a pink pear shaped floating blob of annoyingness. And uh, he represents that whole uh, lineage of tropes. Classic, classic. I feel like this game speaks to me not only from the art, but there's like a particular style of humor as well. And there's just so many, you have some sample cards up on hordesofpower.com, but even like the simple basic ones that are like, you know, the the name of the unit is the bad looking, but totally inept henchman. And it's got a little comic book style. Every card is laid out essentially like a comic book panel. And it's very like art first. Like there's a, there's text on there, but it's not a lot of rules text. It's really focusing on pulling out the theme and the feel of the card and just looking through the images, you know, just having like lots of little chuckles. And it's like, it's sort of, you can kind of <laughs> tell a story just by looking at the, the cards in your hands, the art that you've got there. So just tip of the hat on that. It's just so fantastic. Well, thank you. I, I had a, a lot of fun with that. Like I said, I was an artist first and a game designer second. So uh, the cards are definitely art first, game second. And I've had some fellow game designers tell me that like, hey, these cards are, you know, maybe could be designed a little more friendly towards gaming. And I'm like, well, hey, that's, you know, that's not the point. It's functional. I wanted to feature the art and the cards also, like how you pointed out, each of those characters, they have a story to tell, I think. And if you kind of read through the cards, they have relationships. There's brothers and sisters, fathers and daughters, bad but, you know, inept henchmen. And they all kind of serve a role and have a relationship with each other. And if you read all that flavor text and enjoy the art, that story, I think, kind of comes to life in the, in the game. Yeah. And so ultimately, this is a game that is, it's multiplayer. So it's, you know, two to four players. Correct. And it plays pretty quick. We're talking like 10 to 30 minutes around. Totally. Yeah, it's it's a beer and pretzels game. You can learn it about like kind of five minutes, sit around the table with a couple of friends and, you know, crush his hope and dreams <laughs> with murder and kidnap cards. So Especially in light of like the past few years with COVID and all these things, I've come to really appreciate just the, the pleasure of sitting down with friends and laughing over like a shared experience. And I think one of the things that drew me to wanting to talk to you about Hordes of Power was that this strikes me as a really fun game, but it also hits like a very specific sort of nostalgia point where I get to share memories with people being like, oh, we're laughing about like kind of the same inside jokes we have inherited by growing up through a certain span of content. We were like, oh my God, this is a reference to that. Or, oh, but this art reminds me of this. Or, Did you watch uh, Silverhawks? And it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Like it made me smile. It, it kind of brings joy. Totally. And uh, I really like the way you're approaching different doing this so when when you uh, sat down to create this game like why a card game like is that just because it was your art would translate best that way like what what inspired you to actually make a game versus maybe make a comic book or or use your art in another way so um i guess the beginning of that story starts with i was sitting around with a bunch of other creative friends artists podcasters comic writers all here at local lincoln nebraska where i live and we were playing this ridiculous like british version of slapjack you know the the kids game where you (laughs) know the jack comes out and everyone kind of slaps and you get the cards right except it was themed with like this sci-fi fantasy thing where like all the characters were kind of these outrageous characters and slapjack was like this kind of buck rogers looking space hero and jokingly somebody said like wouldn't it be cool if we all collaborated and made a game and i just kind of took that to heart i went home i started crafting up ideas I got back to this group of friends and said, I think I've got an idea for a game we could all collaborate on. And about 90% of them said, cool, we've got our own stuff to do. (laughs) Go with that. (laughs) 
Uh, but a couple of them did help out. Uh, so, you know, we did some brainstorming and we had very similar experiences to like what you just said, where you're sitting around with friends and you're sharing these nostalgic moments that maybe have kind of been lost in your memories, but this game kind of makes them resurface. So developing it with those friends and play testing it with those friends that kind of stuck through it uh, was a really amazing experience. And 15 months later, after play testing, art development and publication, it was out on the street. If someone is out there maybe thinking about how they would maybe make their own game, if they've inspired by you and they're like, oh, I want to make a game too. You self-published this. You created your the own art for it. You did, did so much of the groundwork yourself. You know, I don't want to project it, but that, that sounds really hard. Was it difficult to go down this path? Like what were some of the challenges maybe you faced? And maybe also then on the flip side of that, like, what were some of the things that were really fulfilling about doing this? Yeah, so this was my first game. Uh, I, I've since published another one, and I, I learned a lot uh, publishing and developing uh, Hordes of Power. Plenty of mistakes that I would love to not repeat as I, if I develop any future games. Some of the bigger ones was I'm, I'm an avid gamer, but I discovered I was a not a very intelligent game designer. Mm. So as I was developing the game and with other amateur gamers, not developers, we were kind of going in a direction. And then I was lucky and fortunate enough to find that there was a group of local game designers here in the Lincoln, Omaha, Nebraska area. And they would do open play testing. So everyone would sit around and kind of play test your game and get open feedback from other designers. So I joined this group and the amount of feedback and knowledge I learned from this group was amazing. And it totally took the game, not in a totally different direction, but in a much better direction. And it prevented me from making a lot of mistakes that I was heading toward. Um, as far as development went. Did you have a lot of the art done before you did that? And I'm, I'm asking specifically because I've had a lot of people that have been interested in making their own games as well. And as they've invested more of their time and resources into making it, sometimes during play testing, they've you know heard feedback that was challenging and they've already invested so much, they felt a lot of hesitancy to like let go of what they've done and shift direction. And is that something that that you experienced going through this as well? A little bit. I mean, obviously any creator or, or artist or writer, you have like your golden you know, nuggets that you want to hang on to. Uh, at the time of this drastic play testing and a shift of direction, I didn't have a lot of the art done. Most of the characters were kind of in my head as a concept. Mm -hmm. and some of them were sketched out. So it was more of a mechanical game change than it was the, the the art style kind of stayed intact. Okay. Um, that didn't alter much. It was mostly game mechanics and sort of how the game would play out. It became much sleeker, much faster, much more of a friendly game as opposed, it was just clunky uh, in, in its original form. Yeah. And these guys really helped streamline it to that fun, quick play that I was looking for. And that's fantastic. And you have an amazing tutorial video, which I just, I have to plug. Uh, I, I said <laughs> I smiled when I watched your, that looked at the card art. When I watched this video, in 15 minutes, folks, you can watch this video. It's on the hordesofpower.com website. It'll tell you how to play. And you're going to either love this or hate it because it is <laughs> the most characterful tutorial I've ever seen. I was laughing like the whole way through. You know, and the thing is, it's, it's a, it is a quick game. It's a streamlined game. And it seems like a game that you could jump into pretty quickly and just start to have fun with. And, you know, I really, really appreciate that that approach. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed that uh that tutorial, like uh, it was a, obviously an artistic decision to make it the way we did. And <laughs> part of it was driven by necessity. Obviously, I self-published. I had a very uh, limited budget and, um, you know, getting some and I, I know nothing about, like you know, video recording yeah. and video making. So I is either going to be forced to hire someone and pay out, you know, money to do that mm -hmm. <laughs> or make a low budget thing. And I decided if I'm going to make a low budget tutorial, I'm going to own that low budget tutorial. And that's kind of what it became is this ridiculous parody of how like low budget a tutorial can be making fun of itself. So, yeah, I think, you know, that humor, I don't know what it is. There's a lot of heart that came through in that video and in all the art you have. And uh, and that's why really, folks, if you're out there, make sure you take a look at hordesofpower.com and check out this game because uh, it just like oozes love of it, of the of it, the nostalgia and like and joy. So, you know, I just wanted to give a, a big signal boost to this because, man, uh, you're doing a lot of really cool things here. And what's cool is like seeing you take sort of risks. Uh, I think that taking that video signal, taking a risk, uh, the way you've laid out your cards, having it be so art heavy versus maybe rules heavy, that's a risk too. A lot of times, maybe in, in a weird way, when you're self-publishing and you're kind of a smaller entity, like you can take those risks. Now, obviously, like being self-published, that brings its own challenges, right? When it sure. comes to like promoting the game, getting out there, you know, how has it been received when you've uh, had people get a chance to sit down and play it at like conventions? It seems like maybe the format and style, how quick it plays might make it a great game to demo to people. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. So I guess just to reel back to the beginning of your question, uh, I kind of told you the origin story of this game, and it was obviously a project of passion. I had no intention of making, you know, tens of dollars off this game. Uh, you know, it was, it was <laughs> You know, I was never expecting it to see it on the shelf of like, you know, Walmart or Target or, you know, be a $2 million Kickstarter project or anything like that. It was meant to be a project of passion that I enjoyed, something I could share with my friends and loved ones and play with, and then something hopefully in a limited distribution, I could, you know, bring a little joy to some of the people that believed in me and my art and my game. So that being said, uh, my marketing direction kind of went on a very like local, small scale. It was, you know, locally uh, published using people here, like the Lincoln uh, area that could, you know, make boxes, make cards, do stuff like that. Published locally on social media, uh, various local conventions. And I mean, just to give you an example, like if you go to my website, thehordesofpower.com, there's not even a way to order the game. Like it's just, it's that small of a distribution. If you want it, contact me, I'll find a way to get it to you. But I just didn't want the hassle of running like an e-commerce store or whatever right. where I'm worrying about um, so that just kind of gives you the context of, I mean, this game was purely uh, a work of art and passion on my part that I wanted to share a little bit with the people around me. So well, that's fantastic. You know, and so we're definitely going to pick up some copies and we'll be giving away some copies. So make sure you head on over to the On the Table Gaming Facebook group and uh, figure out how you can get a hold of some of these, because I'm just excited to have some of these in people's hands. So make sure you guys stay tuned for that. And then, you know, I think some of the big things here is, you know, were there... Um, as you're going through, just to give a little bit more overview of like the gameplay, you have this great story that's playing through through playing these cards, but ultimately you're trying to accumulate power. And there's a really cool play mat that you're on that's kind of tracking points up. And so the, the goal is to accumulate that power and it's sort of moving in a uh, like a half crescent on this tracker. Um, what other kind right. of, you know, for, for people who are kind of wondering a little bit more about like some of the details of the gameplay mechanics, you know, how else can we go into a little bit more detail here and, and kind of illuminate that? Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the uh, the score tracker because obviously there's a, a million ways to keep track of, of score in a game, simple ways. And this one is kind of unique, I think. And it was done in that half circle pattern because it, again, it accentuates the art. In the inset of that half circle pattern is a big piece of art. And then the game boards like connect to make like a bigger piece of art and that half circles connect to make a full circle. So totally art centric, but still functional as a game. And that was like a huge, obviously a decision and a risk uh, I took. Let me see what else is kind of unique about the game. I will, I will talk a bit about, so... You can worship these uh, deities in the game that grant you bonuses to your whore that can help you uh, throughout the game, uh, either bonuses to cards or give you a special ability. And my favorite deity, uh, we already talked about Karen, the goddess of entitlement. Um, <laughs> Not your favorite? Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> Not my favorite, but there's, there's this chap called Crumb, and he's based off Conan's yeah. Crom. Like, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the mythos, but he's like, he's this uncaring God that just Conan does not pray to. And he just kind of sits on his mountain and laughs at, you know, the trials and tribulations of man. Well, if you're unfortunate to draw Crum as your God, he grants you courage and no other bonuses in the game. <laughs> but if you can somehow beat your opponent, you know, you, you get to relish in, you know, everlasting shame that this, you know, you beat this guy with no special ability. So that, that's just kind of one of the quirky things in the game. Uh, just stuff like that uh, to have fun with. Absolutely. So, so, so amazing. You, you mentioned you're working on some other things that this was your first uh, published game. What else is, uh, what else is cooking? Right. So um, after Hordes of Power kind of made the local circuits around Lincoln and Omaha here, the local Hobby Town store uh, carries it. And uh, they contacted me and said, we'd like you to develop a game with us where we'll we'll buy the, the parts and pieces and do the manufacturing. But we want you to do the development and the art. So uh, last holiday season, I made an advent calendar game. Okay. Um, which is like your typical, it's like an advent calendar meets a choose your own adventure book. So as you open a box, there's like a little narrative in there, and then you make a decision. And instead of going linearly through the advent calendar, you jump around to the different boxes and it tells like uh, this story. And it's very, very fantasy, like RPG based, like you're a barbarian trying to beat this evil witch. And, and it, again, meant to be fun. And you're opening up the advent calendar. There's all sorts of little like 
toys and prizes that go with the game, um, but also feed into a fantasy RPG uh, setting. So that was the second game, and, and um, that was a success, and it sold out. Very small, limited distribution again, but uh, Hobby Town has asked me to do a sequel to that, and hopefully we'll have that on the shelves by Black Friday again this year. And is that something that if people wanted to get their hands on, they could use the Hordes of Power email to contact you? Or what's the best way to kind of stay on top of all the cool stuff you're doing? Um, Hordesofpower.com obviously will tell you all about that game, and that'll lead you to my uh, social media, which is Art of Lee Bachma. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. And that's where I do most of my stuff uh, for the various games and art I develop. I also do like art commissions and other projects as well, in addition to game design. Oh, so sweet. I try to keep myself busy and out of jail doing this kind of stuff. So how do you do you like introduce yourself as that? You're like, you know, hi, uh, I'm Lee Bachma. You, you might know me as the creator of Hordes of Power or <laughs> are people generally like into that you're a game designer here or do you not see yourself in that lens? Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge local celebrity here <laughs> in uh, Lincoln. Much, much like the tens of dollars I'm making, I have tens of fans. There so, we go. Uh, hey, yeah, yeah. 11 now. I don't know. I just think it's so cool what you've done here. Well, thank you, Chase. I'm excited to get some copies and we'll give some copies away as well. So, uh, you know, make sure you guys head on over to the On The Table Gaming Facebook group. And uh, on this post, we'll give you information about how you guys can get a, your hands on a few copies. And uh, yeah, so you got your Facebook page is the art of Lee Bachma. Correct. Okay. And then Instagram, what's your Instagram handle that we can follow you at? Same deal. Perfect. Art of Lee Bachma. I right, keep it nice and simple. And so then you you, say you do com commissions. So like if someone's got like a D&D &D group and they want to get their characters drawn or things like that, you're down for that. Yeah, yeah. You'll totally see that on my... Uh, uh... Social media, I've done actually a ton of D&D art commissions here in the last uh, half year or so. So, yeah, it's been fun. So I had a blast talking to Lee, and uh, we actually picked up a couple copies of his game. Be sure to head on over to our Facebook group to find out how you could win a copy of this game or go over to his site directly and purchase them from him. And with that, we're going to switch on over to our Song of Ice and Fire content with the Coach's Corner. You know, for today's Coach's Corner, we're joined by Brett Lanfer. And, and I've got a question about is I've been, for maybe some thematic reasons, a little bit weird of the Night's Watch. And uh, in the Heroes Box 2 for the Free Folk, there is a attachment called Jon Snow, the Crow Come Over. Why would I want to take a character like this? I mean, this guy has the order reckless heroism. When this unit performs a charge action before resolving this action, the, suffer the unit suffers D3 wounds, but counts as rolling a six on all distance charge dice. And then he's also got Southern Knowledge. Once per game at the start of any turn, target one enemy in long range and line of sight. Until the end of the turn, they lose all abilities and cannot be the target of friendly tactics cards. So that's his two-point attachment. And there's also the four-point NCU, Jon Snow Turncloak Crow, with Southern Discipline. Once per game at the start of any round, you may search your tactics deck or discard pile for one coordination tactics or regroup and reform tactics card, and it's your hand, shuffle your tactics deck. Why do, why do we want this guy coming along in our list? What, what do we got here? How can he speak to his, uh, can we redeem this character, this Jon Snow character? So here was the big thing. When I was when I was playing Free Folk, I had my primary Mance list. It was a lot of like raiders and some tech pieces mixed in. When I built the next list, I knew that I wanted to play Styre because I think he's a strong commander anyway. But I wanted, the, the biggest thing that I think Free Folk have to overcome is what am I going to do in the mirror match? What do I do when I face another Mance besides we're both beating our heads on the wall trying to break through five plus morale raiders while swinging with <laughs> almost no attack dice? How do I get past Mance? And I was looking and I was thinking I wanted to run Styre because Final Strike is a very good way of getting rid of low defense and it's a hard counter to the Chariot. The Chariot charges in, does a bunch of wounds to you, you Final Strike, the Chariot probably dies. So I was sold on that. And then I was like, what is the tech piece that I'm going to bring to deal with Mance? And then I looked at Jon Snow. And then I looked at Thin Supremacy. And I said, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to use Jon Snow. And I'm going to shut off Mance's morale bubble. I'm going to taunt with my uh, Thins with Styre, And I'm going to bust him in the face with Thin Supremacy. And if I can get rid of Mance, the list mm. falls apart. And so that's kind of what it came down to. And it, when it works, it works. Um, even if you get rid of like their torment attachment by taunting him in, how uh, dare because, you? Yeah, what? Well, but it's it's a key piece, <laughs> right? It's, it's a key piece. So if you can shut that down and break them, 
break their key piece, then you've got the ability to kind of start to overrun them. And the best way to do that is a big burst attack like Thin Supremacy. And then if they don't die from Thin Supremacy, then Steyr can activate, use Hold Line, and then finish you off. So that was kind of what it came down to for me. But I don't think it's just useful in the mirror match. I think, again, it goes back to so few control pieces in this version of the game. When you can just point at a unit and shut their abilities off, it's really powerful. Um, any stalwart or any morale buffs that my style list personally hinges around that taunt thin supremacy combo. And when you can, you can shut their morale protection off and taunt them in, if you're really devious, you'll taunt them over stakes and then they have to deal with thin supremacy as well. It's such a potent move and it's so deadly. So that's why I was using uh, John Crow, oh, excuse me, John Snow, the crow come over and then the turn coat, the turn coat. Crow. Tongue, tongue twisters. I like John tongue. Crow, though. I like that. That's what I'm calling him from now on. Yeah, he's John uh, Crow. John Crow. <laughs> so his NCU brings something really important to the Mance list that I was running. And that's what I actually believe is one of the core concepts for Free Folk, is using the adaptive from Free Folk Raiders to bring expensive attachments and then switch them over to more elite units. So I take that concept, and I really like Harma's attachment for Sentinel. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really love the ability to Sentinel a free charge into a unit after they attack you. And then Harma's not activated, so she can just hold the line if she's in thins. And suddenly they're looking at a seven dice charge, presumably into the flank, immediately followed by a, an activation with five automatic hits in another attack. It's hard for any unit to live through that. So that's a seven point unit if you put Harma in the thins. But what I do is I put Harma in a unit of raiders and I always deploy my empty thins next to that unit. And that's because mm. with Jon Snow, I know for a fact that I will get coordination tactics. I don't ever have to worry, or excuse me, regroup and reform. I don't ever have to worry about when am I going to draw this. If I draw it in round one or two, great. I'll play it. I'll make the switch. Then I can use Jon Snow to either play regroup and reform a third time, or what's even better is playing a third coordination tactic. Because yeah. coordination tactics oh. is one of the free folks best cards. So if I can triple war cry with uh with Tormund or if I can triple hold the line for free, then uh that's a win. That's a win. So I think Jon Snow is actually a really cool tech piece just to throw into your list, throw your powerful attachment into a unit of raiders with the intent of switching that attachment to a, a more elite unit. And you're basically cheating a point out of list building. And it's a guarantee if you've got John, because you'll get the card no matter what. Oh, man. All right. So you sold me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring him in here. I'll suck up my pride. We'll have a, a dirty Night's Watch person, uh, a crow come over, John Crow, join my list here. And I think I'll I think I'll start off trying out with the NCU with that uh, with the Thens and switching them around. Yep. Um, I, I, there's there's a ton of cool combos that you can do. Even even if you throw like a Champion of Bone in a unit of Raiders and switch it over to your followers of followers of Bone, so that they hit like a ten ton truck with vicious and intimidating presence. That's there's it's literally infinite combos that you can do. You're just basically like I said, you're cheating a point out of list building. That's fantastic. Yeah, man. There's so many options here. And I, uh, I did just get my hands on Veramir Sixkins. Had my buddy Josh pick it up for me. And uh, so I'm looking with the extra activations there too to see what other list building ideas. So now I can now I have even more scheming to do here. Hmm. Yep. These last There's few boxes have been really, you know, mind blowing. Yeah. Oh. It's been, <laughs> it's really nice. It's a good time. It's a good time good to time. play Free Folk. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, sweet. Thanks so much for our quick little update then for uh, some some in encouragement to get people out there trying out, you know, Jon Snow in your list as a Free Folk player. Many of you probably already are. Um, I can be a little bit weirdly stubborn on some of my list ideas. So I will definitely break him out and get him in. And, and thanks for the inspiration for that. Oh, absolutely. Perfect. All right. Well, until next time, sir. Until next time. <laughs> we hope you get your miniatures on the table.